I'm Laura London, and this is a special video edition of Speaking of Jung. Joining us today for episode 133 are Jungian analyst Anne Yaoman in Devon, England, and Professor Kevin Liu at the University of London. Dr. Yaoman holds a PhD in English literature from York University in Toronto, where her dissertation was on literature of the fantastic through the lens of analytical psychology. She then entered analytic training at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich, where she graduated with a diploma in analytical psychology with the thesis Peter Pan, J.M. Barrie's 20th Century Myth of Eternal Youth, which was published by Inner City Books in 1998 as Now or Neverland, Peter Pan and the Myth of Eternal Youth, a Psychological Perspective on a Cultural Icon. For over 20 years, she served as Dean of Students at the University of Toronto's New College and developed and taught a suite of courses in applied analytical psychology, supported in part by the late Marion Woodman. Since returning to England in 2008, she has lectured throughout the UK, taught at the Jung Institute in Zurich, and holds a monthly study group for local therapists on the psychological and clinical use of fairy tales. Dr. Yaoman has served as president of the Ontario Association of Jungian Analysts, served on the Ethics Committee of the Independent Group of Analytical Psychologists in London, and is an active member of the Association of Graduates in Analytical Psychology in Zurich. She was editor-in-chief on the book Body Dreaming in the Treatment of Developmental Trauma by our episode 96 guest, Marion Dunley, collaborated with Professor Kevin Liu on the award-winning article Jungian Psychosocial Studies, Akira, Greta Thunberg, and Archetypal Thematic Analysis, published by the International Journal for Jungian Studies in November 2023, and also with Professor Liu, co-authored the forthcoming book C.G. Jung's Collected Works, The Basics, part of the Basics series from Routledge, which includes C.G. Jung, The Basics, by Jungian analyst Ruth Williams. Kevin Liu is a professor of applied psychoanalysis at the University of London. He completed his undergraduate work at the University of Toronto and is a founding member of their Jungian Society. He went on to earn a master's degree in the psychology of religion from Haythrop College at the University of London with a dissertation on Jung's stance on the existence of God through the lens of synchronicity. After being awarded an ORSAS grant to pursue a PhD, he entered the doctoral program at the Center for Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex and earned his doctorate with a thesis on Jung and history. Professor Liu worked as a visiting lecturer at Haythrop College before joining the faculty at the University of Essex, where he served for 14 years. He is a former head of their Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies and director of their master's degree program in Jungian and post-Jungian studies. He has served on the executive committee of the International Association for Jungian Studies, is a member of the adjunct faculty at Pacifica Graduate Institute in California, and is an honorary professor in the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies at Essex, where he is currently their director of blended learning. His research areas include oral history interviewing in relation to sibling networks in the Chinese-Vietnamese diaspora, the adaptation of graphic novels to film, depth psychological approaches to an examination of cultural artifacts, and psychological approaches to understanding racial hybridity. In a 2020 article, Professor Liu explains how analytical psychology is already a hybrid psychology, therefore well positioned to speak to the specific experiences and challenges posed by multiraciality. Since 2023, he has been serving as Professor of Applied Psychoanalysis and Head of Department Practice at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama at the University of London. He is the co-author with Anne Yaoman of the forthcoming book, C.G. Jung's Collected Works, The Basics, which is the subject of our talk today. You can help Speaking of Jung stay on the air by visiting our support page, where you will find information on our new Patreon membership, 
which includes perks with every tier, how to make a one-time or recurring donation, shop our Amazon storefront, register for online video courses, which now include the past two Jung Memorial Lectures by Donald Kalshed and Ann Ulanoff, as well as two new courses by James Hollis. Shop online using our referral codes and interact with us on social media. Go to speakingofyoung.com slash support to learn more. I am also here to remind you of the importance of recording your dreams. Temino Stream is a revolutionary dream tracking app available for iOS and Android. Now you can record your dreams by speaking into your phone or typing them into the app. Search for myths, legends, and fairy tales drawn from more than 26 cultures related to the themes in your dreams. Use the new advanced AI interpretation with a focus on Jung's work, looking closely at symbols and associations to consider shadow, anima animus, archetypes, and much more. You can help support Speaking of Jung simply by downloading the app and creating a free account. Unlimited use is available with a premium subscription. Click on the link in the description box below or on our website, speakingofyoung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This video interview is being recorded on Wednesday, March 6th, 2024, through the magic of StreamYard. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. I'd like to know how you two know each other. Uh-huh. Uh, I I'd think like to take that one. <laughs> let's tell your side of the story first, Prof. Ed. Well, um, it was when I was at the University of Toronto and I um, developed this suite of courses um, applying young psychology to literature, film, art, culture, fairy tales, everything. <clears throat> and one year, Kevin arrived in my class, mm -hmm. and I thought, we'd had a couple of classes, and I thought, this one is going to be uh, a real tester. And um, two days later, Kevin rushes into my office and says, ah, I'm so excited about the course. This is what I want to do, and you're going to help me do it. Mm -hmm. And that's where it all began. How long ago was that? When was that, Kevin? 2002. That was early... 2002. Was okay. So I was very lucky to um, to have another undergraduate mentor, Professor Timothy Brooke, in the history department. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in uh, the context of working with him as his research assistant, loving history, but having that moment when I realized just history on its own wasn't enough for me. Mm -hmm. that with his blessing, I started exploring these other options throughout the University of Toronto. And I had always noticed um, Anne's courses and wanted to take them. And, you know, by third year, when I was in this kind of transition of moving programs, eventually moving uh, colleges as well, that I said, well, let's do it. It's now or never. Um, and it really was that eureka moment of, of reading, um, the books and texts, the primary sources that Anne really mm -hmm. centered um, as the foundation of her courses, yeah. but also her teaching style, her warmth, her compassion. And for me, it was a real turning point in my life and showed me how powerful education uh, actually is, how important it is to connect to people, um, especially in a university context where many people can feel depersonalized because some of them are so big um and and really just created that safe environment within that small class of, of 20 or so so you're sitting mm -hmm. around the table sitting around couches um that ability for her to let the conversation develop for her to guide it but also to have it leak out into other areas so into the, the sitting areas at new college um, at key points in the academic year, like Christmas, to, to leak into to Dean Anne's apartment as well. So it really showed me how powerful education is, and it actually influenced me to, to go down that route as well. So I owe a lot to Anne, and it's such a privilege to be able to, to collaborate with her and to have this perspective and dynamic that we have together. So Dr. Yalman, how were you able to 
when you were teaching at the University of Toronto, how were you able to teach Jung's analytical psychology? Ah, well, New College was um, one of the colleges that was built and developed in the 60s. And in the 60s, um, there were a lot of people looking for jobs and so, some of them were a bit sort of on the fringe. And a lot of the um, more established colleges um, didn't want anything to do with some of the most interesting people who were looking for jobs. So New College became peopled with um, a lot of professors who were interested in um, interdisciplinary studies. A lot of them were actually interested in Jung because in the 60s, Jung yeah. in, in North America became a little bit of a cult figure. Um, and um, so when I said that I would like to go to Zurich to train, they said, yes, go. And then when I came back, they mm -hmm. said, will you please teach? Wow. Mm -hmm. When I'm you, not sure, I'm not sure if it was approved of by the Department of Academic Psychology at ah. U of T, but certainly yeah. was at New College. So when you trained to become a Jungian analyst in Zurich, you went there full time? Uh, no, because I had to maintain my job. So I would okay. take leaves of absence. I mean, mm. the, the the, the longest leave was about 18 months. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I could really settle in there. But I was sort of back and forth. Quite you were bit. back and forth. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, Professor Liu, what made you interested in Jung? That's a great question. Um, I think at that point in my life, um, you know, initially, I kind of entered the University of Toronto um, with a bit of indifference, you know. Um, I think it's it's fair to say that that I wasn't necessarily doing it for me. I just felt like this is something I had to do, and I had other interests at the time, including music, <laughs> cooking. So mm -hmm. U of T was almost as if this is for my parents. I just want to get it done, get it over with, and I'll get on with my life. Um, but it was in the, the context of entering U of T, finding Tim Brooke first, who really mentored me um, and was the first one who really kind of mirrored and recognized me. And it was actually in conversation with him. One day I was showing him some work I was doing for him. And he just said in passing, almost as if it was a statement of fact that it would be a real shame if I didn't enter academia and complete my PhD. Mm -hmm. And I think it was needing that kind of recognition for me to say, wow, I am smart, <laughs> you know, I can commit to this. And now it's more about finding the thing um, that is really going to, to light that fire within me. And it was a point, and I, I think it's a point for many people entering uh, higher education. It was just a, a time of discovery. Obviously, I, I've had my own psychological difficulties, conflicts, etc. And when I was given the opportunity through Anne's courses, to actually read Jung um, and to, to engage in his words, it's it's when things just jumped off the page. Um, mm -hmm. I really felt that same recognition in what Jung was writing. It was a, a very mm -hmm. personal style. It was as if everything I ever felt, every conflict was finding expression in his words. Mm -hmm. And I think it was that excitement um, and also with Anne being the person conveying that and, and facilitating that growth and, and in-depth reading of Jung that actually really ignited it. And I just took it to the extreme. I think that I'm that type of person. And she really, um, not many people know this, but I can't even remember how many reference letters you wrote for me. Um, <laughs> I think she had <laughs> several files uh, for my references. And one thing that kept me going, this kind of dream, because she told me about the, the conference they had at Essex, this kind of informal agreement of, of sending their students in, in that particular direction, because at that time, the MA Jungian and Post Jungian Studies was the only course, and I still think mm -hmm. it's the only course where you can yeah. study Jung at postgraduate taught level. Um, and it was just that tenacity and, and her support that really, made me feel that this was the the kind of right journey to to go in and you know i've had my 
ups and downs with Jungian thinking. I think everyone does. Everyone brings that criticality and that questioning. Um, but it's always about finding that um, that element or that goal that's still within Jung, that's still worth maintaining. Um, and I think that's what keeps me going now. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Yaman, would you, as a Jungian analyst, tell us and, and share with the audience a little bit about the difference between being an academic and studying Jung that way and working as a Jungian analyst? Right. Well, I, I'd like to back up just for a yeah. minute because um, I think what's also important is that how I got into Jung. Yes, um, yes. Sure. I discovered Jung actually when I was um, doing my undergraduate degree in Montreal. Okay. Um, and, um, and then later when I um, was in Toronto, I went um, to York University mm -hmm. because I was drawn by a particular graduate course um, called Archetype, Myth and Symbol where all of the sort of great works of visionary literature from the Book of Job through Dante, Milton, Shakespeare, the Romantics right up to Joyce um, were being taught by somebody who was in her training at Zurich. And I sort of give a little plug for York University now. They, they have a wonderful humanities division where there's all kinds of interdisciplinary and experimental study going on. So um, once I started that course, um, then it became really clear to me that I would go on and finish my PhD. And of course, that's where um, I got the idea for writing about the literature, the fantastic Mervyn Peak from a Jungian perspective. So that's what got me into it in the beginning. So mm -hmm. the way I learned about Jung academically was being taught by an analyst. Mm. And I do think that makes a huge um, difference. Um, <clears throat> when you're Why? Why would you, would you tell, say a little bit more about that? Why would you say that? Um, Very interesting. Because you can give um, examples, you can talk about dreams and things yeah. um, in a way that I don't think you can in the same in the same way if you approach it purely academically yeah it's it's like um i mean we're, we're, when we're working we're continually working with stories whether that's the narrative of a dream or the, the story of what is going on in somebody's life um and it's really important when you think of story um, well, if you think of fiction, you know, it consists of a story and a plot. And the plot is all the facts, but the story is what binds those facts together and brings them to life. And um, I think that can happen more easily if you're not just working with the plot, the facts. Mm. Um, yeah. And you can bring it alive through story, mm. um, which is actually okay. what we've tried to do in the book. Yes. Yeah. And could I add, you know, yeah. Laura, I think in in the way we've been able to to work together, for me, you know, the difficulty was to, and N always wanted to, to instill this in me, um, is that we can't always be in the mentor-mentee relationship. And she never really wanted me to to address her formally as professor, et cetera. It, it was her way, I think, of of um, cultivating in me that kind of inner strength and um, and um, I guess respect for myself in terms of developing my own abilities. And I've what I've found in terms of the way we've worked is very similar to what you're describing here in terms of the academic and the more kind of clinical. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that we've been able to work is to kind of balance both yeah. in the sense that we're coming from both a place of thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. And I remember mm -hmm. um, Prof. Anne, I don't know if you remember this, but Tula, 
one of your colleagues yeah, yeah. when she we, we found out I was heading overseas to to go to the University of London. Um, one thing she very intuitively pointed out was that she said to me, "You will find your success when you can match your think your thinking with your feeling, and that you can mm -hmm. write from that place of feeling." So mm -hmm. I'd like to to think <laughs> and feel that we're by working together. I am kind of moving towards that position of not just speaking from the thinking function mm -hmm. and the way mm -hmm. you write the way you kind of bring things to life really challenges me as i think we've challenged each other through this process mm -hmm. one of the things that impressed me when i was in zurich was mm. the emphasis on working both with the head and the heart mm. um, which i think was an important focus of our training mm -hmm. and ties into what you were asking us before mm -hmm. Well, this book, uh, if, if we may jump in here, um, is part of Routledge's series called The Basics, mm -hmm. which I wasn't aware of. And there are over 180 books in this series. And mm -hmm. there's only one on Jung. It was written, as I mentioned, by uh, the analyst Ruth Williams. Um, but this one that you two have written, and it will be published, the publication date is March 18th of 2024. It is currently available for pre-order at Amazon US and Amazon UK, Amazon Canada, and directly from Routledge. There will be all the links in the show notes uh, for this episode. But this one is specifically on Jung's collected works. And The Collected Works is this very daunting series of 20 volumes. I think it was published in English in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken. It was first published in German. Do either of you know when it was originally published in, in, in English? It depends on the volume yeah. um, because they were staggered in terms of the publication mm -hmm. dates. Okay, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. I, I think of it as one because... Mm -hmm. I have the digital edition, uh, sure. and that is really the most economical way to purchase the collected works. It was re-released just last year um, by Princeton University Press, so the digital edition, it's around $550 US, but you get all 20 volumes. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, for the beginner or the advanced or analysands like myself, this is a great book. Uh, I did get an a advanced copy from Routledge. Oh, Thank you. And it is very manageable. And you to cover everything in this book. I think it's about 220 pages. It's five chapters. And I'm interested in, we can get to the progression of the chapters and, and how you structured it the way that you did. And there are uh, I think it, there was an abstract at, at the beginning of each chapter, and there are tables at the end of each chapter. Mm -hmm. And you also include references and additional reading. So who would like to begin with how this, who had the idea for this book? How did that get started? <laughs> um, <laughs> that like, feels good. Yeah, I think originally um, it was Rutledge's idea um, to, to, to put out a, a call to, to colleagues within the field about who wants to put in an okay. expression of interest to write this. Um, and originally it was myself and another colleague who uh, together uh, put in um, an expression of interest and we were uh, awarded the contract. Um, but because of other work pressures, my other colleague had to, to back out of that. And that's when I realized and asked myself who is going to be the best person to convey this information, to synthesize, um, to be critical, but also to kind of honor Jung's words. Um, and I guess for me to, to see the initial vision I had, um, which really goes back to that clinical perspective, but also that academic perspective, but really everything we do is based on our subjectivity. So mm -hmm. when I was thinking about this book initially, it was like, who's the best teacher of analytical psychology I've had? How did that person teach? How did they embody the work? How did they convey that information? How did they make it alive? Um, and that was a really important part of it because the challenge is really to write in an accessible, man an accessible mm -hmm. manner 
that is jargon free, that reaches the widest yeah. public possible. Because sometimes what you find in academia is that people love their jargon, which then creates silos in terms of in mm -hmm. terms of disciplinary boundaries. And that really then closes off the extent to which people can just engage with those ideas. Oh, yeah. So it was really important to, to write accessibly. Um, so I had that hat on in terms of how do we teach Jung in the Academy, not just based on my experience, but I was thinking particularly, you know, of Anne and the foundation I had at the University of Toronto. Um, but then also as a student of analytical psychology, thinking back all those years um, and my time at the University of Essex and in that department teaching undergraduate, postgraduate taught and PhDs, what would be the most useful thing to have in terms mm. of not just the collected works, um, but really accessing Jung, accessing mm -hmm. some of the really um, amazing quotations um, regarding a, a particular theme or concept. And those tables were a part of my PhD, but I just had this idea, let's extend this and do it for the entire collected works, which was really daunting. And I reached out to Anne um, she reluctantly said yes, and I think we soon realized how simple the concept was, but how difficult yeah. it was to execute. And, and I I'm think sure. that's why the process was a bit longer. So credit to Rutledge for being very patient with us. But I think we needed that time to explore and to really hone in on what we wanted to mm -hmm. say and what needed to be said. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yaman, your experience? Well, yes, I got the phone call from Kevin. <laughs> and um, so I thought about it for um, a couple of days and then said, yes, OK, I'm in. And then I think it was after that we realized what a huge task, yeah. what a huge undertaking it really was. And that um, we would need to work really, really hard to make it all accessible, but not to oversimplify. Mm -hmm. You know, capture how complex and nuanced Jung's thinking is, um, but also make that accessible. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why we kind of delayed the work for quite some time, because we really thought, I don't know if we can do this. Mm. But See, I didn't know about... Would. Mm -hmm. and yeah you yeah you decided you would and you did and yeah. i didn't know about the delays so when did you both decide to do this and then it's to be released in march of 2024 wow that would entail laura going back to contracts <laughs> and looking <laughs> at the time frame i okay. mean i think i think there were lots of things happening i think ann and i had the to world. find a rhythm yeah. we had to find a rhythm yeah. so there were several visits um, to where Prof N is located in the UK. I mean, where Prof N is sitting now became our office. And, and we, we took snapshots of all the books yeah. that we had laid out on the table. Um, but it was I'd that love process. I'd to see those. Yeah, it was a process of really figuring out what we were doing. There were a lot of starts and stops. There were other yeah. iterations yeah. in terms of the flow. Yeah. I think we originally had eight chapters. Um, and mm -hmm. I think it didn't help with the pandemic either, because I think before the no. pandemic started, we had actually scheduled in a time for me to be there to work. And mm -hmm. as you can imagine, when the pandemic hit, it really was all hands on deck across all institutions in the yeah. UK. Wait, so I didn't know it went back that far. So yeah. you're saying that yes. you guys started <laughs> working on this before the pandemic, which the pandemic started in March of 2020, which was four years ago. So this yeah. started before yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah, it did just started before that. Um, but we just decided that, um, you know, w w when we be we began, we thought we were going to do everything in the collected works. And of course, that was impossible. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we were we were trying to work together. And then we decided what we have to do is work to our strengths. So um, Kevin's the researcher. And I'm the writer, so okay. um, so so we split it in that way, and um, I think that really helped us get going. Mm -hmm. 
So let's go through the book. Um, I have the table of contents. I'm going to have to bring it up here um, because it's not uh, on my screen right now. But I was a little surprised that it was five chapters. I was wondering how it got, how 20 volumes got into five chapters. So tell us a little bit about how you have the book structured. I think as Prof. Anne was saying, initially, um, we wanted to cover everything in mm -hmm. the sense that it was the the, the creative um, evolution of Jung's thinking. I think that's what, what was always the aim of what we wanted to do. Um, so as many of your viewers will know, with each volume, it's not necessarily necessarily a chronological snapshot. So organizing in that way, having that principle as the, the, the guiding uh, sense of the narrative was really important to us. Um, and that's why we're, you know, that's why we started where we did. Now, in terms of the ending, we did initially want to cover all the applied aspects. So Jung and alchemy, Jung and the psychology of religion, um, Jung on clinical practice and, and, and psychotherapeutic technique. But it just became um, a point that it was not really manageable within the time frame and ethos of the basics book. So we really kind of took that as a guiding principle. You know, what is this? This is the basics of the collected works. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. why we really honed in on the development and creative evolution of the concepts themselves, mm. which is why you have a real deep dive into those core concepts. So yeah. what makes analytical psychology unique? What are the ideas that set it apart from psychoanalysis? So from Freud, from Adler, from object relations. Mm -hmm. And that really became our guiding principle in terms of the chapters. That mm -hmm. is very key and very important. And I appreciate that because people want to know what is the difference? What is unique about Jung? And Jung said this and Jung said that. And okay, let's let's break it down. Let's see what he really did say. And where did that come from? And that's why chapter one is titled the germination of C.G. Jung's interests and ideas. So you go, you start with him as a student and spend some time on the word association experiment. And why? Mm -hmm. Because that's so important to his mm -hmm. theory on complexes, right? So you, you start there and you just keep going. And then you bring up Freud in chapter two, and then chapters three and four are part one and two of Jung's model of the psyche. Mm -hmm. I, I love how you put that and that you put it in two chapters. And then the last chapter, chapter five, is the dynamics of the psyche. So then there's this epilogue. Yeah. And a glossary. And an index, a searchable index. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we mm -hmm. sorry. No, please. Um, no, we 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 found that um in order to really do Jung's um basic theory justice, mm -hmm. we would need the book, the whole book. And that's why we put the other things that we would have liked to have included, like his his work on religion, alchemy, etc., as a little epilogue, mm -hmm. because um, our feeling was that what we needed to give readers, and our readers we're hoping will be students, people who are doing research on young, um, give them as best a grounding as we possibly could, because they need that in order to take it to um, the work he did on things like religion and alchemy. Mm -hmm. Like where did it come from? What were his yeah. influences? That's right. mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think Anne and I toyed with the idea of pitching <laughs> to Rutledge a part two, uh, <laughs> but because they, they were so patient with part one, we just yeah. said, let's leave it at that. You know, let's tie it up in the sense that the epilogue leads you um, to, 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 to the parts of the CW where, if uh, if readers are really interested, then we do have a, you know a map that allows them to kind of delve deeper into those particular volumes. But and you know as Anne was saying, it really was focusing on the basics. What's the core? What are the core <laughs> principles? What is the absolute foundation that we want to build for those who are interested in Jung, approaching Jung for the first time, not knowing where to start, mm -hmm. but again not scaring people off. I think mm -hmm. when you enter into 
that kind of more academic realm, you could scare a lot of people away because of, you know, the, the vast extensions of Jung's thinking, post Jungian thought. And we don't want that because ultimately there is something for all of the, uh, the problematic aspects of, of Jung's thinking, we still preserve that thing, if you will, Laura, that made me go, aha, this is it. And for Anne, aha, this is it. And hopefully we're, we're cultivating that through this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Yaman, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I, I think what, one of the other things was we, we, we wanted to use Jung's words because um, it's very easy for people to turn to interpretations of yeah. Jung and never actually read Jung. Yeah. And um, they can get further and further away from Jung. Yes. By doing that, although there are some brilliant interpretations which we've listed in the back mm -hmm. and recommended. Um, so we, we were we were wanting to use Jung's words as much as possible and sort of elucidate them um, so that we wouldn't frighten people away. You wouldn't and frighten the, people the, away, yeah. No, and bring them in mm -hmm. to read Jung and mm -hmm. keep reading Jung. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there really isn't anything like this. I'm sure people are going to say, oh, what about this? What about that? Mm -hmm. Written by a Jungian analyst and a professor of Jungian studies that breaks down the collected works. I mean, I remember ooh, back in the 90s buying, jo I think it was the 90s, buying Joseph Campbell's The Portable Jung, mm -hmm. which extracts from the collected works. But that wasn't breaking down the entire collected works. It was just bits and pieces of, of the different volumes. And of course there are extracts from Jung's collected works, but to, it's such a huge body of work. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find things in it all the time that I swear I had never mm -hmm. seen before, or <laughs> I had never heard anybody yeah. reference before. And I'm like, was yeah. that in there the entire time? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. So it's gigantic. And what you've done here is you've you've explained kind of the flow of it, which kind of sometimes doesn't make sense. This volume and that volume, and it's yeah, mm -hmm. like you yeah. said, Professor yeah. Lewis, not in chrono chronological <clears throat> order. So mm -hmm. this is wonderful, and I'd like to know a little bit about your process. Of did you? take notes on each volume and then say, we're going to do this, this, and this, or how mm. did you distill it down? To yeah. This? Yeah. That's really important. Um, Prof, did you want to go first? Well, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, what, one of the things that was um, in my mind all the time was writing the story. Mm. And that's why we started with, you know, the, the seeds, the germination of the seeds um, of, of Jung's thinking. So I, that for me was really important because um, excerpts from his work or long quotations from, from his work without weaving them into a narrative um, can be a little off-putting, yeah. um, doesn't invite you in to really kind of understand the development of his of his thinking mm. his experiences through his lifetime mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah like so, how did he get here yeah 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 so like i said before it's it's plot it's the it's the content but it's that's carried by the narrative yeah mm. yeah and I hope. It, yeah i think so and and can i also say it, it is an homage, if you will, an homage to to how Anne taught us in terms of those new college courses. So um, one thing she always wanted us to do was to struggle with the text. Because as you say, Laura, we can get collections yeah. like the Portable Young, which I still have, and actually yeah. Anne assigned that. that the Eureka yeah. moment was in the Portable Young. It's yeah. a shame it's, you know, it, it's not 
in um, in print anymore, but I have mine. There there are flags everywhere uh, in that thing. So it was a real joy to um, to engage in that. But as you know, when we delve into the collected works, we realize, and this is um, something that Susan Rowland has explored extensively. You know, Jung as a writer is is very difficult because ultimately he was trying mm -hmm. to write the unconscious. How do you bring structure and order to something that is ultimately um, fluid, um, mm -hmm. that is, is protean mm -hmm. in nature? And that perhaps gives a framework to understand why that writing can be so difficult and so elusive at, at times. But I really see what we tried to do here was not to compromise in the sense of here's an introduction. This is more of a companion that you bring yes. along the journey to struggle mm -hmm. with you're reading and when you're running into those little struggles things that you don't understand it's it's a little map it's a little guidebook that perhaps just helps nudge people or point people in the right way so that you know we we just get back to exploring the terrain and as you said the richness of of the terrain every time you go back and you reread there's something that you didn't realize was there or you see it in a new mm -hmm. light very much like i think you know jung's individuation process that it's both cyclical and linear we return to a text mm -hmm. and i saw prof n when i was trying to create those charts seeing her mm -hmm. rereading something and the eureka moment um and say oh that's so interesting it's so fascinating i, I just can't remember you know i can't fathom how that was missed and what i really appreciated um seeing Prof Anne's process was that you had this photographic memory that was shocking Prof Anne, that you remember <laughs> what side of the page your mm -hmm. notes were on and you were trying to think that I was like wow this is this is incredible and to be able to work through that and to kind of find what our initial notes and what your your notes said and to be able to kind of relocate that, I, I think was a, a really fascinating process. Mm -hmm. So Laura, what it really took was rereading a lot yeah, yeah. of yeah. Jung. Um, mm -hmm. And I think what was really excruciating for me was selecting what we wanted to put forward as let's say um, the entries in the charts. Yeah. And I think we did have a lot of back and forth uh, yeah, in terms of did. what we include, what we don't include. Um, because there's a lot of our subjectivity of what we love about Jung and what we want mm -hmm. to present. Sure. So I think so long as readers realize that, that ultimately, even though we are trying to, to capture Jung in his own words, there, there has to be an element of selectivity in, in terms of the vision and our version, if you will, of Jung. But I think, again, people are there to read it critically to challenge it, but also to kind of find their own path through the collected works. Mm -hmm. One of the things in creating the, the narrative was I was imagining speaking to students, watching their faces, and you know, you get a blank face on one, and you have to remember that and then go back mm -hmm. over what you've just said and give a different example, come at it from a different point of view. And that's what um, I tried to do throughout the narrative. You're, you're introducing a difficult topic and then you say, hmm, you know, this is really dense. Let's look at it this way. Here's mm -hmm. an anecdote. Here's an example that, that Jung gave um, so that it, it isn't just presenting difficult content. Right. It, it's saying, you know, let's look at it this way. We, we, we bring in a bit of neuroscience. We bring in some, you know, examples from literature, from film and things like that to, to make it relatable. Yes. And yes. I think that's what the difference is in the book. Mm. That's what I'm saying. It's, I find it a very unique because it has the perspective of each of you, with, which you both have so much experience in this field and not just the book learning, but the interaction with students, with analysands. And so you bring all of that to this. So Dr. Yalman and Professor Liu, you two collaborated on a journal article titled Jungian Psychosocial Studies. I mentioned this in the introduction, Akira 
Greta Thunberg and Archetypal Thematic Analysis. It was published in the International Journal of Jungian Studies. It is available open source on Brill.com. There will be a link in the show notes. And I'd like to ask you both to tell us uh, more about it. Fantastic. Thanks, Laura. Um, so um, it was actually in one of our marathon sessions um, where uh, at Prof Anne's house where I brought up the idea um, of this paper. Mm -hmm. So as you know, you know, University of Essex, it went from the Center for Psychoanalytic Studies to the Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic mm -hmm. Studies. Um, and for me personally, I was during my PhD attending a lot of events at Birkbeck um college university of london and they had you know at the time one of the most influential uh departments for for psychosocial studies so it was in many ways already embedded in my thinking uh and also being mentored by a historian as well there was already that kind of social focus if you will mm -hmm. to some of my work and this idea came about i would say basically from my phd um uh under the supervision of, of professor roderick main mm -hmm. and the original uh attempt if you will in my phd was looking at jung's thinking on synchronicity but looking at synchronicities four and five so we have one two and three yes but four and five are the the possibilities if you will of two external states meeting without the intervention mm -hmm. of an internal state uh, and the possibility of two internal states meeting without the intervention mm -hmm. of an external situation. And this is where I was completely fascinated. And as with all PhDs, what you end up producing is only a small fraction of the big idea. Um, and I remember when I was applying for PhDs, um, my MA thesis uh, supervisor, Brendan Callahan, uh, said to me, that you have to realize that your PhD is not your magnum opus. You know, mm -hmm. it is the key that <clears throat> unlocks the door to the thing that you want to do for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So these ideas about finding these global historical interconnections, the relationship between events that may be a causal rather than causal was something that was always germinating in my mind. Um, and I was lucky enough through the, the course of being at the University of Essex to really delve more into um, so, uh, sociological theories and methodologies. So the idea of wanting to find a space for analytical psychology in that conversation was always bubbling in my mind as well. And it just so happened that the content, if you will, the idea was always there. But the content really shifted in 2019 when what I felt I noticed was the convergence of these two on the surface, completely unrelated, mm -hmm. not connected instances, but really then finding, well, what are the psychological links? Mm -hmm. And could we find a way to connect this meaningfully, something that actually resonates? Um, because I felt it was so important to see the child archetype being constellated and reaffirmed, not just in the figure of Greta Thunberg, but this cult film that started as a, a manga series, um, Akira. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the initial challenge. And what it became more and more, and this is perhaps from the more academic point of view, is that you have to honor Jung in the sense of both the conscious and the unconscious. As Anne was uh, saying earlier, the academic the clinical, the thinking, and the feeling. So what the project became was first and foremost, how do you prove an archetype? And this is something that we always struggle with, at least uh, you know the, the conversations I've had with, with colleagues at the University of Essex. When that challenge comes up, how, how do you do it? Um, and my approach was to say, we could do it through qualitative analysis. Um, and creating this methodology, seeing and exploring how Jung's thinking might help us shape the collection of data in itself is a really important research tool. So I think that was really the important aspect of the first part of the paper. The second part of the paper, which I think um, colleagues 
will already know and, and have more experience with is how do we then meaningfully interpret it from a Jungian point of view? So how do we add value? How do we show that important perspective that Jung and analy analytical psychology actually adds? And that's how the, the paper started as this kind of then two pronged approach that we use Jung not only to distill the data and how we collect the data, but then how we interpret the data. Mm -hmm. And it was again, in conversation with Anne, in, in my usual way, that kind of enthusiasm perhaps that she saw all those years ago that were chipped away for many years because of mm. you know the, the pressures, if you will, of working in in higher education in the UK. When I pitched it to her, I said, What do you think? And she she sat there and she thought, Yes, you know, I see it. And then I said, Do you want to do this together? <laughs> and she probably thought twice. And it, I again. Did. It, it was a really painstaking process because in creating a methodology, a way of working, um, we were really entering into new terrain. So I mm. think this is when we really expanded the way we collaborated and how we approached collaboration, because it was in this in this context where perhaps she felt my approach might be too academic. And sometimes I felt we were moving further and further away from the crux and the punchline of what we were trying to uh, to achieve in the paper, that that collaboration really flourished. And I think we could frame it, and, and Prof Anne, you can jump in here, about just holding that tension within each other um, and, and the process mm -hmm. to kind of create something that I'm actually really proud of. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel the same way about that, Prof Anne. Yeah, I do now. <laughs> yeah. what was what was it for you Dr. Well, I mean I I when when Kevin um first started talking about the idea I mean I could see it mm -hmm. um but of course we had to um include in the paper write the paper um with the background of what had been going on in um qualitative analysis in psychosocial um, studies and I thought oh no because he made me read these long articles that no. were very dry oh. and so um, but then when when we actually got into the um, into the work and um, you know writing about the um, essay that Jung wrote on the archetype of the child and how that enabled us then to um, analyze the data that we found in both the film and in Greta Thunberg's talks mm -hmm. and speeches. Mm -hmm. um, it got really, really exciting because the, you know, the pattern, the patterns were there. The, the patterns correspondences were, there. Were, were there. Yeah. So yeah. Professor Liu, would you say a little bit more about, you know, there's there's so much interest in synchronicity. And one yeah. of my pet peeves was always that it was yeah. misunderstood. So would you yeah. say a little bit more about what you mean by four and five? Because I heard you in a in a mm -hmm. lecture uh, mm -hmm. explain one, two, and three and say that you you didn't really have time for four and five. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I will provide a link to your mm -hmm. online talk um, where mm -hmm. you do delve into synchronicity level one, two, and three, but say mm -hmm. a little bit more about four and five yeah i mean it, it could have been a snapshot of my time of life at that particular point <laughs> because perhaps you know coming out of my phd experience there was a sense that i hadn't set out to to do what i wanted to do and a part of that i could say was perhaps based again on my own subjectivity knowing that very consciously going into my project for for Jung in history Mm -hmm. It was trying to um, honor my mentors, uh, one historian, one Jungian analyst. And it was such a, a, a difficult process. And the result that I came out with in that thesis wasn't necessarily what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. So I was really struggling. And synchronicity that initially was such a big part of it that what it actually came out uh, as was just the foundation of exploring what 
a Jungian approach to history might look like, and ultimately what were some of the barriers for that dialogue and that conversation to happen. So for me, it was a lot of unfinished business. And I think there was always that love and interest in synchronicity, which is why Roderick Main um, was my my supervisor. Um, and you know, he very patiently guided me through that entire process. But I think it was always lingering in terms of my understanding of global history, how Tim taught me history, and how I always had this intuition of how Jung fit into that in understanding global connections, not just necessarily on the conscious level, but the unconscious level. But again, finding a way to articulate it um, in a very academic and rigorous way. Mm -hmm. And I think it actually needed all that time for me to, to find mm -hmm. out what I was actually wanting to say. So basically from 2011 to its publication date in, in, in 2023. Um, so it, it is a long time coming. Um, what I appreciated and what the in intuition was, was that basically Jung gave us a code book. The way he described the child archetype yeah. uh, and also other archetypes, he was basically showing us these are the key themes that you're looking for. So if you're looking for thematic analysis, he's basically saying, here it is, search this out and see whether or not yeah. it applies. And it was just really simple to, to make that connection, to make that justification. And I think we're pretty open in the sense that we have a particular angle that we're taking to this. But equally, as Anne was saying, the evidence was so compelling in terms of how this archetype was constellated. So by the end of part one, hopefully what we've shown is that yes, this can be contested. Yes, this is subjective, but you can't really doubt that yes, there's something there that we need to explore a bit further. And one reason why I felt it was important to work with Anne specifically was that she's a clinician. There is this split, as we, we said earlier, Laura, yeah. between academia and, mm -hmm. and, and, and the clinic, if you will, or the analytic uh, practice-based aspects of analytical psychology. And for us, it was really important that we did have two authors because the methodology that we created necessitates two people to enter that process of triangulation, to enter that process of negotiation. Yes, I agree with this. No, I don't agree with how you coded mm -hmm. that. And it was really important to have, again, the more academic, but also the more clinical, just to check, check, each, uh, check each other, this kind of process of checks and balances. Um, and ultimately, that is one of the findings, if you will, of the paper is that when we approach this, it's very easy for us to just prove what we set out to prove in the first instance. It's like marking your own homework. Um, and it was really important for us to begin to separate that, to have those conversations. I mean, some of the, the, the paperwork that we developed um, in the process of agreeing, not agreeing certain themes, it was a really taxing process um, to watch Akira several, several, several mm -hmm. times probably was not Anne's favorite thing in the whole wide world because it's a very challenging film. But hopefully at the end of it there, there is something rich that colleagues can take away and develop in terms of what ATA archetypal thematic analysis actually is and what it entails. Would you, would you say a little bit about archetypal thematic analysis? Would you give a brief definition of it for, for the listeners who are not familiar? Yeah, absolutely. So I would frame it as a psychosocial methodology, a method for doing psychosocial studies. Um, a lot of the debates within psychosocial studies really focused on whether or not this is perhaps a more kind of intellectual interpretive process, mm -hmm. or is it a way of actually doing the research itself? And that's why we mm -hmm. focused more on psychosocial with the hyphen um, mm. it is contentious. I think this is what Anne was saying <laughs> in terms of <laughs> how nitty gritty it got, but, you know, Anne very, um, judiciously saw that hyphen between psycho and social as a bridge between the, the psychic and the collective. Um, and what ATA is, um, is a way of working, is a way of approaching data and how we do Jungian psychosocial studies. Mm -hmm. So if we were looking, let's say, at a particular 
social phenomenon that we wanted to investigate further. How would you begin looking into that from a Jungian point of view? Basically, what we've tried to do is outline one way you can begin to approach those texts that you might be looking at. It could be written texts, it could be visual, it could be um, diaries, historical, um, you know, uh, netnography <laughs> is another thing in terms of getting stuff and garnering information from the internet itself. So it's a way of kind of approaching that data that you actually collect in the first instance. So really, it is meant for the purposes of a research methodology. But again, but again, us answering that challenge of what does it mean to actually prove the efficacy of analytical psychology, mm. and what do you mean by the constellation of an archetype? Because mm. if you if you look in a lot of the literature, it's actually taken for granted granted that people say an archetype was constellated. But right. yes, how how do you right, prove right, that? Right. That was the part of our intention in that paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I mean, Jung always talked about how complex the psyche was and how nuanced. And I think that's an important part of it as well, because you can you can sort of look at something and think, yes, there's an archetype that's been consolated here. But then to really show it through a really deep um nuanced analysis of all the symbols, the language, um, to really, really indicate, really prove, if you like, mm -hmm. that, yes, all of these things together add up to a constellation of this archetype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think in the second movement in the paper was really looking at what Roderick did in his his paper, The Social Significance of Synchronicity, mm -hmm. which was published um, in um, PCS. Um, my goodness, why is the, the name of the journal? But it's, it's, a, it's a great paper. Um, and what we, we really did was to take that as our springboard in terms of fantastic, you know, Roderick has laid uh, a foundation of how we might use synchronicity in terms of our interpretation of social phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And we just took that as our springboard to say, well, we could do that as well. But we tried again to really allow that interpretation to exist once the hard work of the data analysis happened in the first instance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that interpretation via the lens of synchronicity was only possible by working in a Jungian way in the first instance to distill the data and the evidence. A couple things. So Professor Main was our guest in episode 117, if anybody would yeah. like to become more familiar with his work. And then I have a question. So Dr. Yeoman, your thesis on Peter Pan and the myth of eternal youth kind of reminded me when you were when I saw this article that you were saying that the child archetype had been consolated and it just kind of harkened me back to Dr. Mm -hmm. Yeoman's work mm -hmm. on, on Peter Pan and, and that myth. So did, did that enter your mind at all, Professor Liu? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. um, because um, for that, I needed everything that Jung had ever written. Okay. The right. archetype of the child. So right. yeah. Um, so as we come to the end of our time together today, uh, I would like to ask both of you what you're working on now, moving forward. Professor Liu, you will be speaking at the upcoming Psychology and the Other Conference uh, being held on campus, the London campus of Northeastern University that's coming up in July of this year. And your talk is titled Psychoanalysis and the Other, Teaching the Ineffable in a Culture that Demands Hard Evidence. And that has been an ongoing theme on this podcast, which is what is reality mm -hmm. and the reality of the psyche. 
and Mm -hmm. is something real if there is no hard evidence for it? And very specifically, Mm -hmm. what we've been addressing here Mm -hmm. is the UFO phenomena and all of these claims of UFO sightings and alien abduction without any hard evidence. So that's what caught my eye. And I was wondering if you would tell us a little bit about that upcoming conference. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it's in collaboration with uh, our colleagues at Northeastern, so uh, Aaron Daniels, William Sharp, um, but also my colleague, uh, Aaron Balick, um, who we were at Essex together. So we, we got our jobs together um, and obviously went our separate ways, but stayed close friends. But yeah, long story short, um, Aaron brought me in to do some teaching for the Northeastern series, where through their really innovative and amazing exchange program, Uh, Northeastern and William in particular would take some of the psychology students there, take them into London and really begin to unpack what a larger depth psychological approach and understanding um, would look like. And that is the part about, you know, trying to teach the ineffable, i.e., you know, the the concepts within depth psychology, um, but also the fact that it's okay not to know something. Mm-hmm. And, and to be mm-hmm. able to explore that further, where in their discipline in psychology, there are these kind of hard facts. And we wanted to kind of challenge that. And it was actually through that experience of creating undergraduate courses um, and going back to the theme of what we've really focused on, how do you teach it in a, a lively manner, an accessible manner, but also with compassion, with love, with integrity, And that's what we're trying to explore, what it actually means to preserve that ethos with you, uh, if you will, that philosophy um, within depth psychology and to teach that to uh, an audience where we're taught that certainty equals truth, Hmm. that in order to really know something, we have to be absolutely certain about it. And depth psychology teaches us the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, to be able to to sit with not knowing yeah. is a really mm-hmm. important tool and skill as well. Um, so we're really lucky to to be able to to be speaking together. And you know, as we said from the start, Laura, there's so much subjectivity that's in those relationships. Right. It's myself, Aaron, uh, and William being friends and just trying to work out how do we teach psychoanalysis to an undergraduate audience? What are the challenges? And again, a lot of my approach um, stems from my experience with Anne. Um, So really this is the legacy hopefully of New College or at least one legacy of (laughs) of all the amazing things that happened in that college and in that classroom. And Dr. Yalman, uh, do you have anything coming up? Um, I'm working on two things actually at the moment. Um, One is a well, what I hope to be a book on fairy tales, but some specific fairy tales okay. that I've discovered um, no one has ever written about. Mm, nice. And uh, I find them particularly interesting. I won't go into the titles. That sure. Moment, but um, yeah. I find them particularly interesting because they don't have the usual ending of a fairy tale. Mm. Um, the, the, the kind of resolution that yeah. we are normally looking for interesting and the um protagonist if if you like is sort of left at the end of the tale in um the unconscious there's no there is no resolution so it seems that these fairy tales are working at a dynamic or they're illustrating a dynamic that happens at a very deep level of the psyche um, which needs to happen before um, uh, the next step, really, which is bringing things to a level um, where you can work on them consciously. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's sort of, I, I don't know if you've ever had sort of dreams where there's never been a narrative or an image, but you feel that sort of... Um, sort of seismic shifts have been happening. Mm. Um, so I think these these particular tales talk about the kind of unconscious conflicts that need to happen um, first before ah. um, 
before we start to intuit that something is something is moving down there, something is going mm. on, there's a complex that needs to be worked on or whatever. Mm. I love it. So I love it. And you said there was a second one? Yeah, it's a novel. Ah, um, okay. So I'm sort of playing around with an idea where you can certainly read the characters as complex characters and um, the dynamics of their relationships, but also you can read the characters as aspects of one psyche. Mm. Yep. So I don't know if it'll work or not, but I'm uh, about 100 pages in at the moment. You're working on that right now. Okay, so yeah. we look forward to to hearing about that in the future. And I'd like to thank you both for all of your time with us this evening. It's uh, afternoon here. It's evening where you are. And uh, you've, you've uh, given up uh, a large uh, portion of that to us here today. And I'd like to thank you. And... Um, ask you both to uh, keep in touch and uh, have you back at any time uh, to discuss your uh, further work, your forthcoming work. Uh, was my honor to have you both here today. And I really appreciate you sharing everything with us. Uh, there will be tons of links in the show notes for this episode. So uh, thank you again, both. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Please visit our website, speakingofyoung.com, for more information on everything discussed in this episode and to access all of our previous episodes, available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Jung is also available on YouTube podcasts, which you can access by subscribing to our channel, Jungi and Laura. It's free. Just click the subscribe button below. I created Speaking of Jung nearly nine years ago as a free podcast. All of our content is still free to access, but it is not free to produce. Please consider supporting us on Patreon, where we are offering perks such as book quotes and additional show notes with every tier. So with very special thanks to the fine people at Routledge, Sarah Ray, Purgati Sharma, and Katie Randall, I am Laura London, and you've been watching a very special video edition of Speaking of Young. <laughs>